Remember we, t- we, we mentioned in Jude where he talks about speaking evil of dignities. And the first chapter of Revelation, to me, is the most intense statement on how the body of Christ, the church, functions. How it works. And it's important to have a revelation of this so that you don't get confused about what your role is supposed to be. And then the second two chapters are basically very intense uh, statements to individual churches about what those individual churches were doing. Right? So that's what we're going to read. I'm going to read a little bit faster than we did with Jude. But what I want you to hear as we begin to read... um, this revelation, and what I want you to hear is the church, what it looks like. And in, in it's in its in the big picture, the huge ten thousand foot view, what's the church look like? So this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. The revelation of Jesus Christ. We're going to reveal Jesus to you. That's the purpose. Now, this is very interesting when you think about this in light of Philip, have I been so long with you and you've not seen the Father? And so then people say, oh, Jesus was the Father. No, Jesus was the Son. But he said, have I been so long that you've not seen the Father? Who was Jesus revealing when he was on the earth? The Father. Everything you see Jesus do, you see his love, you see his compassion, you see his mercy, that's the Father. That's all of it. You know what this is? It's a revelation of Jesus. See, Jesus came, he didn't show himself showed the Father. Now we're going to get the revelation of Jesus. This is Jesus talking now. Now, it's a revelation that God gave to Jesus. This is very interesting. The Father is going to take, it's like, I'm going to go and I'm going to say, Frank, I'm going to reveal yourself to you. Okay, I'm going to give to you a revelation of yourself. Okay, that's, that's what this is basically saying. The Father, God, is going to give to Jesus the revelation of Jesus to show, what's Jesus going to do with it? To show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his messenger, his angel, unto his servant John. So Jesus receives from God the Father a revelation of Jesus, takes that revelation and he reveals it to it to reveal it to his servants here's what he does he gives it to a messenger the messenger takes it to john and he gives it to john and john bears record of the word of god the testament of jesus christ and of all things that he saw blessed is he that reads and they that hear the word of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand so that's the message right john writes to the seven churches over which are what? Pastors over those churches. So what this clearly says is God gives the revelation to Jesus, who gives it to his angel, who delivers it to John, who takes it to the pastors of the seven churches to give it to the seven churches. Okay? That's the church. That's how it works the body fitly framed together by that which every joint supplies, and the head is Jesus. Okay? In other words, this structure that God puts in place is extremely important. Notice God didn't come to me, and I'm a member of the church. He didn't come to me and give me the revelation, and then come to you and give you the revelation, and come to you and give you the revelation. He gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to the angel. The angel gave it to John. John gave it to the pastors of the seven churches. The pastors of the churches read it. Now you can pick it up and read it. You can read it, but you need to understand who, how it was given. You need to understand that this is how it comes. Okay? John to the seven churches, which are in Asia. Grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was, which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the princes of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our own sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he 
Who's he? Jesus. He comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and all, they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Whoa, the first revelation we have of Jesus is that the earth is going to wail when he shows up. That's intense. And here's Jesus talking, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, and John's talking, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Notice, I mean, I'm your companion. What do we, do, what do we endure? Tribulation. We endure, we're in the kingdom and the patience of Jesus. That means th there's, there's a lot of going through stuff. So a lot of patience that's required. Um, which was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass, as they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shines in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. We're going to read the rest in a minute. Think about this incredible revelation here. This is Jesus revealed as Jesus. This is what he looks like. See, when you saw him as the Father, the lowly Lamb of Galilee, in a sense, you saw that. But this is Jesus. He's, he's intense. And when you see this, the sun shines in his strength. I, just, I like to think about this one. Have you ever looked up in the sun? That, I mean, just think about how intense this vision is. Boom! All your senses are completely overwhelmed. It's just so much more than the physical body can handle, which is why he fell, on his, he, he fell at his feet as dead. He couldn't look. He couldn't see. It was just more than John could take physically. He just, it's just, wow, that's intense. Okay? Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden sandsticks. He's going to explain to them what he saw. The seven stars are the messengers, the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven churches. Okay? This is basically what's going on. It's pretty intense. God is working through his church. Jesus is working through his church. The spirit of God is given to work through the church. It doesn't work another way. Remember we read in Jude and in 2 Peter, these are those that separate themselves. They're sensual. They don't have the spirit. The spirit brings you into the body. The spirit... Uh, lines you up within the things that God is doing, puts you in place, and, and you, you fit within the body. Those that separate themselves, they're out wandering, doing their own thing, looking for some men to follow them. They're not doing what God told them to do. It's not, it's not it. This, this hierarchy is extremely important. So then comes his messages to each of these seven churches. Because when God gives a message, there's a message that's given to everybody as a whole. But sometimes there's a different message you need to receive than I need to receive. There's things that maybe you need to know that I don't need to know, or I need to be corrected about that maybe I don't need, and things I need that you don't need. You know, this is why sometimes pastor preaches long, he's dealing with everything. <laughs> he's dealing with everything. 
You know, he's, he's, he's getting at everything that's there, everything that he's seeing, everything God's showing him. He's dealing with everything. And so sometimes it takes a while to get around to everybody's need. And, and a lot of times it's not that specific. He's still speaking in general, but there's so many different needs, right? So then, then you end up with two chapters worth. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works. Do you realize that Jesus knows what you do? He's not confused. He's not wondering. I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil and you have tried them which are say they're apostles and are not and you've found them liars. You've borne and has patience for my name's sake. You've labored and you've not fainted. <coughs> Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. Wow. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto you quickly and remove your candlestick out of his place except you repent. Then he says, and here's, here's one other bone for you. You, have, you also have this, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that has an ear to hear let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I just want to comment on the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I have read a lot of things about the deeds of the Nicolaitans. There are old books that talk about, you know, they've compiled lots of stuff. I don't know that the Scripture tells us who the Nicolaitans were, but history tells us many things about them. And let me just say that the, the best I've been able to understand that seems to be the oldest information about what this really was. It was a, basically a doctrine of absolute lascivious fornication, allowable, in the church. That, that's what God hated so much, because it was a doctrine that allowed such to be within certain parameters. And no, we do not agree with that. No, we will not accept that. And God's very intense about it. So. When you look at this, what's Ephesus' biggest thing? I mean, he's, he's commending them for a lot of stuff. Because a lot of times people, why are you picking on me? I've done all these good things. Look, Ephesus is full of good things. But I got something against you. You've left your first love. You've left your first love. Wow. What, but Lord, what does that mean? He says, repent, do the first works. What's the first works? Lord, it's all about you. Lord, be merciful to me. Father, I thank you that you saved me when I was unsavable. One of the things that people have to guard against is pride. That's being lifted up in pride. We begin to think that somehow we've attained to these things by our own great doing. And that's never the case. And when I have pride and I stand up and begin to think, I have built this wonderful thing, I have to be brought down. We have to stay in meekness and lowliness and brokenness before God all the time. Never allowing ourselves to say, I'm so good. I'm such a great whatever I do. I'm the best vacuumer the church ever had. I'm the best piano player the church ever had. I'm the best catcher the church ever had. I'm the best uh, camera operator the church ever had. And you can take the smallest little thing and you can be lifted up in pride over what you think you have done that's so much better than anybody else has done. And that's how you leave your first love. Your first love, why do we love God? It's not that we love Him, it's that He first loved us. You've got to understand, you've got nothing if He doesn't give it to you. You have no place if He doesn't provide it for you. You receive nothing if you don't receive it from Him. When you take it up yourself, you're going to lose it all. You're going to lose it all. So that's really what, to me, when I think of you left your first love, it's like, well, what, is, what do you mean your first love? They, they don't love you more than these? I mean, what, what is he, what's he talking about? But it really, it's talking about understanding that God loved you first. Don't be prideful. Ephesus was a mighty place. I mean, think about it. They got Paul there. They've had John there. They've had, I mean, that's a mighty place. It's pretty intense church. It, they, they could probably stand and go, look, we are the church of churches. We are above all. We're the greatest there ever was. Careful. Don't do that. Don't go there. All right. 
So, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works, and tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear to hear... He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Smyrna, they got it all right, but he's warning them. There's going to come some tribulation. It's going to come stuff. I, I, I recognize what you're doing. I recognize how you're standing. There's going to be some tribulation. Don't faint. Don't faint. Stay. Stay. You're going to be fine. I'm going to take care of you. And I just want to comment again on how he ends each one of these. He talks about he that has an ear, let him hear. Okay, which is very important. But he also says, he that overcomes. And so to him that overcomes, he's going to eat the tree of life in the midst of the prayer of God. He that overcomes shall not be heard of the second death. You have to overcome. What are you overcoming? Sin. It's really what you're overcoming. Okay, and what Ephesus needed to do was need to overcome the sin of pride which was coming to them to begin to make them think that somehow they had done it. Smyrna, they needed to stand in the tribulation. It was going to be a difficult time. You know how the, you know, Pastor Ruth was just preaching about the sower that went forth to sow and the seed that's in the ground it doesn't have a lot of purchase in the earth. There's a lot of rocky soil and the tribulation comes, the sun comes and burns it up. You don't want to be those people. You want to get, get down in there deep, get the rocks out. Yeah. Right? Okay. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges, the one that comes out of his mouth. I know your works and where you dwell even where Satan's seed is, and you hold fast my name, and you've not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. They've done some good things, even had a guy get killed for the gospel here. I have a few things against you because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. This is kind of why we want to do this in reference to Jude who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Because that's what Balak taught them to do. He sent a bunch of women down, loose women who came down and got all the men into fornication. Right? And then and had to sacrifice unto the idols of their, their false gods. And that's how they began, weren't blessed. You also have them that hold the doctrine of the Lycolaitans, which thing I hate. So it gets mentioned again. Repent, or else I will come unto you quickly and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Wow, it's, it's intense. I have a few things against you. You're doing those things that in Jude I told you not to do, basically. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes, I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I'll give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows except the one who receives it. That's pretty intense. So we can't say anything about that, because if I got one of those stones, you wouldn't know anything about it. <laughs> right? And under the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know your works, and charity, and service, and faith, and your patience, and your works, and the last to be more than the first. Notice he did works twice. He said you did works, and now you've done even more works. <coughs> Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you. You suffer that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and eat things sacrificed unto idols. Is this all sounding familiar? And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she did not repent? Wow. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. I'll guarantee you what she was doing was subtle. It was subtle. And it certainly probably began subtly. She was doing stuff in secret. And she was bringing this weakness in the people. And that's why when it says, I will kill her children, I don't think it's her literal children. I think it's she's going to kill all those that have followed after her ways. He's going to kill them with death. He's going to wipe them out because he cannot have that spot in his church. And I, and, but he's given, notice his love and his mercy. I gave her a space to repent, and I will do this unless you repent. He's given another opportunity to repent. Um, 
and I'll give every one of you according to your works. He finishes verse 23. But I, unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. So he's saying all of you that have avoided this, that have stayed away from it. See, one of the things about, here's the thing about Jezebel, let me just tell you. Jezebel was married to the king. And the nation of Israel rose or fell according to the, often the goodness of the king. <coughs> you know, when you, when you follow the leader, you're following the leader. This is why we're told, pray for those that are in authority among you. Pray for the leaders. Why? Because don't think that they aren't tried. Don't think that they don't go through stuff. You cry out to God for them. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to know everything about the details of their life or, or try to, to judge whether they're doing the right thing. That's not what, no, you pray for them. You cry out to God for them because God knows what they need, right? But see, Jezebel, when we talk about Jezebel, I, I've often wondered, was she involved in some way with the pastoral leadership? Was that, is that why? Because notice he says here, under, I say unto the rest in Thyatira, as many has not, have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. It's almost as if in the church there's this faction that Jezebel has allowed, gotten into the leadership and has caused this thing to happen. And now there's these poor people, that get, the, the, the leadership's messed up. Right? And what does Jesus say? I know. The key here is he knows. He fully understands what's going on. And he says to them, the message to them is, look, don't you worry. I put on you none of the burden. You just stand firm in what you know to be true. Don't rise up and take the leadership for yourself. Don't go and do something I didn't give you to do. Just stand firm. Because he's telling them, I'm going to deal with that thing. And I'm going to destroy that thing. And he's not happy about that. There's a greater condemnation for the leader than there is for the follower. Because the leader has a greater effect on all the people. I mean, we've seen this in the church throughout history. It's a terrible thing when somebody who's carrying a great anointing, who's carrying a great uh, uh, movement across the earth, and suddenly they fall publicly, and it's a horrible thing. And the fallout is just tremendous. It's an awful thing. This is why we have to pray for everybody like that. We just earnestly begin to cry out to God, Father, use me to pray for those people that you've got crisscrossing the earth, those people you've got going out preaching. Father, I pray for them, bless them, encourage them, keep them. But don't be afraid to do it God's way. Because he knows when you're the one, the little old lady in the church who knows that everything is wrong, who's crying out to God, Father, have mercy upon us. He knows you. He knows who you are. And he has not forgotten. Hold fast until I come, verse 25. He that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he will rule them which are with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. And I will give him the morning star. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Whew. Intense stuff. Chapter 3, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that thou hast a name, that you live and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Just think about the sentence structure here. I know your works, you have a name, you know, I guess my, my name's written down in glory. I, I've got a name before God. I mean, I, I'm, 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 God knows who I am. And you live, and you're dead. What, what does that mean? Because then he says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. There's, there's what's happening here is, because he goes after them and says, I've not found your works perfect before God. He's telling them, look, I know that you came into the blessing. I know that you received the heavenly gift. I know that you've been blessed in glory. I know that you've been made alive. But your works are not perfect before me. You, there's things ready to die. There's things you, you're, you're not doing well. Let's put it that way. You be watchful. Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. 
for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore you shall not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you shall not know what hour I will come upon you. Now, Raphael, in light of your question at the beginning of the whole meeting, you brought up this thief in the night thing that's in Peter. And I told you the thief in the night is not the catching away. This will help you make it very clear. When he comes as a thief, it is not a good thing. He doesn't come as a thief to snatch the church out of the jaws of death. He comes as a thief to bring destruction upon the sinner. Is there a catching way? Absolutely. And I told you where you can find more information on that. But this, what he's saying, I'll come, therefore, if you do not watch, if you do not repent, I will come as you as a thief. The scripture also says, that day will not overtake you as a thief because you walk in the spirit, okay? And you'll not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. You have a few. There's a few. I mean, this place is a mess. It's like we were talking about. It's the one little old lady in the corner who's still got to walk with God, and everybody else is just, who knows what they're doing. It's, it's a bad situation. But he that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So you're seeing Almost each one of these, when we talk about what they're doing wrong, we can find reference in 2 Peter 2 and in Jude about what they were doing. Some of them more explicitly, some of them less so. To the angel in the church of Philadelphia write, These things says he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. I know your works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For you have a little strength. You've kept my word, you've not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved you. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which you have, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So that, that church do doing pretty well. But notice he talks about them. See, Ephesus was filled with all this great swelling stuff. Philadelphia here, they're, they're, doing, they're doing some good things but it's not as prominent. They weren't lifted up in the same pride. And he's saying to them, you know, you're doing good. You're doing good, hang in there. And, but he says, we're gonna do a little bit more. Don't worry, I'm gonna make that synagogue of Satan come and bow at your feet. Because the Jews were persecuted the Christians relentlessly. I mean, it, was, it was pretty intense. And then he just, I mean, I love this part right here. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he will go no more out. That's just... That's just awesome. Boom. Established. All right, verse 14. Comes everybody's, the one, this is the one church everybody kind of knows about, Laodicea. Yeah. There have been people that have taught that these seven churches are seven ages of the church and that now we're in the Laodicean age and all that kind of stuff. I, I don't believe that. I just think that's complete nonsense. I think everything in here applies to every church for all time in terms of warnings and how to do things. Um, and these were seven literal churches with seven literal leaderships, with seven literal different um, experiences in God and things that they needed to do, right? So we need to understand that. Um, these churches um, are not representative of anything other than who they are, but they are um, representative of the church throughout time as a whole in the sense that every one of the problems they deal with, just like every one of the problems that Jude talks about, every one of the problems Second Peter talks about, they can happen in any place at any time. You know, if we had a, some lascivious woman come in and join herself under the leadership and start undermining, we'd have the same problem that that church had where they had a Jezebel in the church. You know, and we're just, thank God we don't have that. Then we're not going to have that. And we're going to believe God because, you know, it says, he says that 
that if you repent, if you overcome, if you, if you just do the things you're supposed to do, if you rely upon the Spirit, if you call out to God, He's going to, he's going to keep you. He's going to keep you from all these things. We don't have to accept, well, there's going to come a day where we're going to have to go through the period of where we have a Jezebel. No, there doesn't ever have to be that day. It doesn't ever have to come. And we're not ever believing for it. But thankfully, he gave a place. He said, if you repent, if you repent, I'll restore. Oh, it's amazing. All right, unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and you're not cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And you don't understand that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee, buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Remember in Jude, those roiling waves that show forth their own shame? These are often... They make a great show of being intensely for God, but they're speaking all the wrong things. Railing against leadership, railing against dignities, refusing to, to do the things of God. Um, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So he says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. They were zealous. That's why they look lukewarm. But they were zealous for all the wrong things. I really believe that's a big part of what's going on here. Just, they had a, a zeal, but not according to knowledge. They had, a, they had a, a show, but it wasn't in heart. That's why they were lukewarm. They would follow, okay, everybody lift your hands, everybody sit down, everybody stand up, everybody sing, everybody shout. Everybody, but there was no heart in it. That's why they were lukewarm. And they were just kind of going through the motions. And that's what he's dealing with here. He says, you don't realize how naked you are, how, how unclothed, and how, how terribly your state is. And he deals with them on that basis. So be zealous, therefore, be zealous, and repent. Cry out to God that he would ask of me gold tried in the fire. Lord, Father, I need you. I'm so hungry for you. And this is what's so great around here. You got people just so hungry. They'll come to prayer. They'll come to meetings like this. They'll come to everything. They'll go flyering. They'll go do whatever. They're just hungry for God. But they're crying out, saying, Father, I need you. They're not doing it to be a show. We're not doing it for any other purpose. Then we're just hungry for God. We're just hungry for God. We're hot after him. We're passionate about the things of God. This is what we need to be. As many as I love, verse 19, I rebuke and chasten. I always remember that. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. As much as he's standing outside your life, pounding on the door, that's a bad state to be in. But you know what? All you have to do is open the door, he'll come in. It's that simple. It's that easy. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear to hear what the Spirit says. Let, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. So, Jude speaks to us of the church and what we need to avoid, what we need to do. And we love that last five verses, the one we emphasize, praying in the Holy Ghost. Got to be in the Spirit, not in the flesh, not in your natural mind, all of that. Second Peter gives us the same story. These give us the same story. If somebody can read these things and come to the conclusion that the church's natural state is to live in sin, they're completely confused. I, I don't know what to do for them because it makes it very clear that you're supposed to overcome these things. There should be no fornication. There should be no lasciviousness. There should be no prideful lifting up. There should be no divisions. There should be no fightings and wars. There shouldn't be these things. And God's very merciful. And people say, well, God understands. Yeah, I, you could argue that in a sense he does understand that there is no way for you to do it on your own. And there is nothing about you that he would want to have in his kingdom when you're doing those things. But he also understands that in his great mercy and love he's given you a way out. He said, repent, lest I have to come and destroy you. That's the part people forget. He wants, you're going to be destroyed. 
Yes, there's a space. I gave her a space to repent. Of all these things you think about as, as I painted the Jezebel thing, that's as bad as it could get in my mind. I mean, it's pretty horrible. Laodicea is pretty bad too, but it's as bad as it could get. And yet he said, I gave her a space to repent, and now you can still repent. I mean, God is so merciful to us that he's so long-suffering. But there's going to come a point where he says, if you, lest you repent quickly, I will come and destroy you. And we need to understand that. And we need to tell people about that. It's called repent. Repentance is the greatest power we got. So does anybody have any questions about any of these? that came up, something you didn't understand. I mean, I went through them pretty fast. You can read them yourself. I think they're great to read over and over. They're one of the great messages that's clearly given to churches about how to overcome, what to overcome, what to repent of. They're, they're fantastic things. Beautiful. I, but I do want to make reference then. Nobody's jumping up to ask questions. I want to make reference to the fact that, as we read, he says, write the things that you've seen. That was the revelation of Jesus physically his body, the revelation of the church as Jesus was the head of it. Write those things. Write the things which are, and we just finished reading those. The things which are, the things of the churches, and all the things that the, you know, what goes on in the church. How does the church function? As we read in Jude, as we read in Peter, how does the church function? Are there things going on that aren't right? Yes. That's why they need to be corrected. That's why correction comes. That's why Timothy is told you've got to rebuke clearly. You've got to make it absolutely certain that people will learn to fear. We've got to do these things, right? That rebuking and correcting is important. God understands that we're growing as children and we have to grow up and we have to learn to mature. We've got to learn to do what's right. And sometimes we get deceived because we don't know and we do the wrong thing. And, and then we've got to be willing to be corrected. We've got to be humble. We've got to be broken before God to allow this to happen. God wants to do it. It doesn't have to be a slow process. It, it doesn't have to be. But if need be, God will send tribulation, as we read. He'll send tribulation to correct us. Why? Because he loves us so much. He doesn't want to see you cast out. He wants you to stay in. He wants you to be a pillar in the temple of his God. Boom! Stuck there. Unmovable. An important part of the structure of everything that God is doing. That's what he wants to do. And then he says to write the things which shall be hereafter. And what will happen in chapter 4, I look and behold a door open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talk with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So those are the things to come. And we're not going to talk about those today. We don't have time. Um, we've done it before in this church a number of times. We may do it again. Talk about Revelation. First one of these I did, I did Daniel. And that sets you up for Revelation. If you weren't here for Daniel, you might want to go look at Daniel. It's, it is on the YouTube. You can sort of look at it. Um, and it prepares you. And maybe one of these days we'll do Revelation if we feel like that the, the Lord would have us do. Um, but I just wanted you to get the picture here in Revelation. Because we're only doing, it's like, why are we only doing the first four chapters? Because we're only talking about the first two things. The things that shall be hereafter, we have to talk about another day. It's a bigger deal. So, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you that you've loved us so much, that you've loved this people with an everlasting love. Lord, that you've called us in our weakness. You've called us in our sin. You've called us in, in just the despite of our own lives, and you brought us into your glory, and you made us a new creation. And you cut off the body of the sins of the flesh and you cast it away from us. And you've given us a heart, a new heart, a heart that will receive from you. Not a heart of stone, but a heart that, was, that is open unto you. And Lord, you've given us of your spirit that we might walk with you and overcome and be dressed with you in white and have a white stone and stand before you in the temple you're claiming your goodness and of your greatness. Lord, you've done all of these things for us. And so many I'm not named. Father, so much that you've done that we might be your people. Now, Lord, let us be those that walk forth from here with a renewed understanding of how to pray for the church, how to pray for the leaders, how to pray for the souls that need to be saved, and, Lord, how to be filled with all the good things of your spirit 
that we might do everything that's pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.